All right. Well, real special Sunday today. We have an awesome guest speaker in Nick Parsons joining us today. Uh, Nick Parsons is such a gift to me and the church. It was because of Nick that I was able to have a sabbatical last year. Uh, he came out and preached on in the summer months for us, and I'm really grateful for him. In fact, as he and Rachel came in today, there was a bit of an applause. Some people might have said we're already tired of David preaching, so no, I'm not sure. No, it's really fun to have this guy. He's a part of an orchard group, which is a church planning organization that's doing has an arm out here in the Bay Area. He co-founded a group called Stratum uh, that Cindy is actually on the board and coaching with, uh, just doing wonderful things in the church uh, uh, realm here in the Bay Area. So can you put your hands together and help me welcome him up to the stage? I'll let you set up there, and then I'm going to read the text for us. So let me go ahead and read our text, and then I will pass things over to Nick. Uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17. If you do not have a Bible and you would like a physical Bible, the words will also be on the screen, you can raise your hand and the usher team would love to come around and get you one. But we're going to be looking at 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 17. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that it is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that, is, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil." Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Hey, guys, it's really fun to be back here. Uh, I was here for I was either five or six weeks this summer, not just speaking on Sunday, but also engaging with the staff uh, and staff meetings and stuff. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of great churches in the Bay Area. We're not supposed to have favorites, but Current really is one of my favorite churches to visit and is such a great, you guys are, you already know this, but such a wonderful team, staff, church to be a part of. I'm so delighted that you're here today, and thank you for bringing me back. It really is good to be here. Uh, I'm also grateful this morning to be teaching from the book of 1 Peter. Uh, if you have a Bible, like he said, you can go to 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 13 through 17. We'll kind of be there, but we'll also be throughout the book of 1 Peter. Uh, I want to look at a few sections written by the Apostle Peter to the early church, reminding these early followers of Jesus of the great story that they are a part of and that all people are actually invited into. Uh, for context, 1 Peter is a letter written by Peter, uh, the same Peter who is a disciple of Jesus, if you're familiar with his story, the guy who was always putting his foot in his mouth. Uh, Peter was always quick to speak or to act in the Bible. Uh, sometimes that meant he steps out in faith and he walks on water. Uh, other times that means that he's going to do something or say something that leads to Jesus correcting him. Peter was kind of like an act-before-thinking kind of guy. Uh, but, but those stories that we hear about in the, in the Gospels, they were literally decades before the letter that we are studying today was written. By the time we come to the writing of this letter, Peter is a man of old age. He's matured. Uh, he has faced persecution. He's faced imprisonment. He has suffered and grown up in his faith. And not too many years after this letter that we're looking at is written, Peter is going to end up being martyred and killed for his faith in Rome. And at the time of the letter that we are looking at today, 1 Peter is being written, or was written, Peter is kind of coming to the end of his journey in the world. And he's writing to a group of Christians who are beginning to face the kind of persecution that Peter himself had long endured. And so he's wanting to give them some encouragement. He's writing to encourage these believers, to remind them of some important truths and to help steady their faith as they begin to face real difficulties and challenges. And it, to me, at least, it felt fitting to explore something like this book as we enter into a new year, which is likely to be filled with wonderful, positive moments and memories, and also likely moments of difficulty and trials for all of us. Most years are. And I love how Peter encourages believers in this letter. It's, it's very deep and rich. He doesn't just say, hey, when you're facing difficulty, you know, buck up, keep on, keep going. He doesn't say, keep calm and carry on. No, Peter does something much more interesting and compelling, something relevant then and relevant for us today. Peter reminds his readers in this letter of the great story that they are living in the middle of. Now, everybody here has some kind of great stories that you love, right? Like some kind of grand uh, series or some world or creative universe that you get lost in or enjoy returning to. 
Uh, for my wife, it's like Agatha Christie's world. Uh, it, it could be the story in the universe of Star Wars or Middle Earth or Narnia. Well, my son, last night, my nine-year-old, he's in the middle of the Narnia books. He came in and was like, I'm in a really good part, Dad. Um, <laughs> It could be the world of a video game like Hyrule if you're like a Zelda fan. It could be Sherlock Holmes in Victoria, England. It could even be sports stories of your favorite team or player. That's kind of me. Uh, for me, I absolutely love the Golden State Warriors. I'm a huge basketball fan. And Clay Thompson, who should come up, yes, my guy, is my all-time favorite player. Now, I know, because I have league pass and I watch all the Warriors games, that the Warriors are struggling this season. Uh, but I'm still a believer and a Clay Thompson super fan. I'm ride or die for Clay. And, and it's not just because of his like basketball skills that draw me to him. Clay, he's just this unique person, uh, this unique and beautiful combination of pure shooting talent, uh, irrational confidence, and a hilarious off court personality. I got a couple pictures of Clay. This is Clay and Rocco. You can also follow Rocco on Instagram. Uh, Clay has an amazing relationship with his Bulldogs. A great, great guy. It's a little bit of Clay's vibe. Let me get the next picture. This is Clay on his boat, Captain Clay. Clay often actually captains his boat from his home to the Warriors Arena for games. He's often also paddle boated across the bay to, get to a game. So Clay, that's just Clay's vibe. Next picture. And this is Clay for Halloween. He dressed up as Will Ferrell uh, with the Flint Tropics. And this is, this is just him showing up to a game, uh, dressed like that. I love Clay Thompson. He is the only athlete, genuinely, I follow on social media because I love him, I love his story, his vibe, and I love especially how he came back from this particular injury and season of injuries. If you follow basketball at all, you may know some of Clay's story. Uh, a few years ago in the NBA Finals, Clay was playing for the Warriors team that had already faced this extremely devastating injury to Kevin Durant. They were down this key player, and then Clay Thompson starts to take over, and he goes for a dunk in the third quarter of game six, the NBA championships. He's fouled, and he comes down hard, injuring his left knee severely. It looked bad when it happened. You knew something was wrong. Later, we find out he tore his ACL. It's one of the worst injuries a basketball player can face. But even with this torn ACL, Clay comes back out from the locker room, makes two free throws before having to leave the game. It was legendary stuff. The Warriors, if you know basketball, you, they went on to lose those finals, and Clay would spend the next 18 months rehabbing that injured left knee. And he makes a full recovery, and he's, worn, he's getting his like, cardio and everything ready to play, and right before he's about to return to the Warriors, he was playing a game of pickup basketball, and he tore his Achilles in his right leg. The other injury no basketball player wants to have. He's got an ACL tear in his left leg. He's got an Achilles tear in his right leg. It's brutal for Clay. These are injuries that have ended other players' careers. And right in the middle of his prime, Clay faces both back to back. It was devastating for Warriors fans and especially for us Clay Thompson superfans. So Clay, he has to go back again to surgery, to rehab, to recovery for another year. And during this time, Clay battles not just against his body, but against depression, frustration, exhaustion. He was kind of open about this at times, how he felt depressed, how he felt. It was just like he mentally was as hard as the physical stuff. And it was this incredible story to watch unfold. And you really wondered at the time if Clay was ever going to return and be an impactful player again. And then when Clay made his return to the Warriors, I was there. Uh, when Clay was injured the second time, I told my wife, eh, you know, I'm going to be at his return game. Like, I don't care how much it costs, I'm going to be there. So I saved up my money. I could only afford one ticket. Uh, up, in the, up, up in the rafters of the Chase Center, four rows in the back arena, I'm there. Here's a picture. This is my seat. <laughs> I was there by myself, and his return was glorious. Clay comes out to warm up. The place goes crazy. And when he's introduced, people are crying. I'm serious. Screaming at the top of their lungs. It's madness. I loved every minute. When the game started, Clay hit the very first shot, and the crowd just goes insane. His very first shot, the crowd goes nuts. I'm high-fiving people I don't know next to me. <laughs> Grown men who are all here are trying to hide our emotions. We're telling our favorite Clay stories. It's awesome. And then in the second quarter, this play develops where Clay drives towards the basket. And two players, two seven-foot guys from the opposing team come at him to block his shot. And you see this, Clay violently dunks on them. <laughs> it's the same kind of dunk situation that he was first injured on. It was a highlight-worthy, high-risk dunk. It's the loudest I've ever heard a crowd get in person. Hugging the guy next to me, 
The whole story come in full circle, from an initial injury during a dunk to a fearless dunk over 941 days later. It was an amazing moment, probably a top 10 highlight any night of the year, but it's the greater story that made that moment so significant. It's the greater story that captivated my emotions. It's that 941 day recovery. It's the greater story that turned strangers in the Chase Center into friends for an evening when Clay returned. Now the Warriors, they go on to win a fourth championship that season. Here we are. I was at that parade with my family and Clay actually sprayed champagne on us. I have a video of it. Like the camera lens gets champagne on it. I should have, I should have shown that to you guys. And now a few years later, looking back, it is even sweeter as it seems like the Warriors basketball dynasty is probably over, I hate to say that. But that moment in that season will always be special to me because of the hardship that Clay endured as he helped bring a fourth championship to the Bay Area for the Warriors. And if you know that greater story, it was, it was what makes Clay's return, that dunk, that championship so significant, it's the sweetest of all of them. And what I think is interesting is I think Peter, who writes First Peter, understands this. Obviously not about basketball or Clay Thompson, but how he knows something about how people thrive in moments of difficulty. It has something to do with the greater stories we see ourselves in the middle of. Clay had some story in his mind that he told himself during this recovery. And each of us too, we also have a story in our minds when we face difficulty. What is your story? When you read 1 Peter, you realize that Peter is reminding the Christians he is writing to, and even those of us who are reading this letter today, that we are part of a larger story. There's a greater narrative surrounding us, a greater story that makes our present moments meaningful. This greater story is what makes our actions matter. It makes our choices matter, and it helps us understand and endure hardship, seeing ourselves also as a part of a greater story. First Peter is a reminder that our response to difficulty depends in some ways on the story that we ourselves see ourselves living in. And so today, as we start this new year, I ask again, what story are you telling yourself? Now, I want to tell some of you the highlights of the story Peter tells his early, early followers of Jesus in this letter. I've got like six points today, uh, and it's a story that is true of all Christians at all times. It's a story that God tells all of his people and one that is helpful for us today to remember today as we enter this new year. So first point in God's story, number one, nothing in your life is accidental. You were chosen. Nothing in your life is accidental. You were chosen. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, it says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered through the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. It's kind of two phrases that jump out for me here, elect exiles and according to the foreknowledge of God. When I see that verse, I see those words. And these phrases might bring up a bunch of important theological questions in your mind, potentially. But I don't want us to jump over the obvious and clear truths that these phrases reveal. It's that you and your life are not accidental, that you aren't self-created, that you were actually made, chosen, elected for a purpose according to the foreknowledge of God. This text reminds us that our stories aren't self-authored. Our stories are being written or have been written by God himself. And this truth might confront some of our modern and Western assumptions that we are totally independent beings. But it should also comfort us that there is a greater author at work in our lives. That nothing that happens to us is a surprise to God. Now, obviously, there's a lot of mystery in this. I do believe we have some level of freedom, accountability, but this freedom operates inside of a world that is created and governed by an author, God. At the very least, we know that he is actively working out our stories to align with his greater story and purpose. And this should give us some level of comfort as we live our lives this year, that even in the midst of suffering, difficulty, uh, whatever we're going to face, that nothing about our life is accidental. It was known by God before this year started. We are part of God's story. Okay, second point in God's story, number two. You have experienced a new beginning, and you have a future that is guarded and protected for you. You have experienced a new beginning, and you have a future that is guarded and protected for you. We see this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3-4. through 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 
and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. What's cool is that in this greater story, followers of Jesus have been given a very clear, fresh start. A new beginning is what the Bible talks about it as. We have been born again. Our individual stories have started anew. We aren't controlled by who we were before we were followers of Jesus. And this is immensely encouraging news to those of us, like myself, that have a past that they often regret. I'm not the person I was before. I don't have to act like the person I was before, think like that person, live like who I was before I followed Jesus. And so I can look back at my past differently without guilt or shame or fear. But I can also look differently at my future. I can look forward differently. For, for, while for many people the future is unknown, for followers of Jesus, our future is actually known. We know where we're headed. It's a future promised to us, protected for us, an inheritance that won't perish or fade. We have a glorious eternity to look forward to, a future without sickness, without sin, without pain, without death. Whatever we face today or in this coming year, whatever difficulty we endure, it pales in comparison to what we'll experience in the final unending chapter of our stories. What we think about the future of our stories matters. Uh, I once had a colleague in ministry who was nearing retirement. He was older. A very well-respected person. He had served for decades in Christian ministry. And he was a man who had struggled for many years with his internal identity. It was a very painful internal struggle for him. In his 60s, he decided he didn't want to endure, resist, or deny this struggle any longer. And so he blew up his life, his marriage, his relationship with his kids. He ended up being forced to exit the ministries he served. It was very painful for him especially, but also for everyone around him. It was shocking and it was difficult for people to understand And I'll never forget what a friend of mine who was a pastor who knew him well said about this situation. He said, I'm so sad that this person stopped believing in the reality of the resurrection. And when he said that, I was kind of taken aback. And I didn't really understand what he was saying at first, this pastor. Because in my mind, I still kind of believed that, you know, this guy, he believed that Jesus rose from the dead. At least least I thought he did. I thought he believed in the resurrection. But what my friend was really saying was that this person who blew up their life no longer believed in the reality of their own resurrection that functionally they had stopped believing that they had a future promise for them, in which all of their internal struggles would be resolved, where the pain of the body, the pain of their mind would be gone. They stopped believing that the story that God had written for them had a good ending. And so they went out and attempted to write a new story, which in my opinion no longer aligned with God's good boundaries for his life. For each of us, for all of us, we face and will face difficulty struggles that we can only endure if we live in light of a greater story one in which God brings ultimate resolution, ultimate restoration, ultimate justice. And standing firm in the midst of our own present struggles only makes sense in light of this greater story, a future hope of an eternity made perfect for us by our loving God. This is how generations of Christians have endured hardship, persecution, physical ailments, loss, injustice, without giving up hope, without abandoning their faith. We have to be looking forward to this greater story. Third point, in God's story, number three, you are not alone. Number three, you are not alone. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10 says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. For the Christians that Peter is writing to, it would have been very easy for them to feel alone. They're clearly religious minorities in a culture that rejects them. Peter is reminding these believers, though, that even though they're scattered in various cities, that they're often meeting in small house churches, uh, that they are also at the same time part of a greater story, part of a great nation, a great people with a great purpose. They're actually now God's own people called from darkness to light. I don't know if you ever feel alone as a Christian, as a believer. Uh, I know sometimes I do, maybe at school or at work or possibly in your family. Uh, You feel alone in your faith. That's often the case, even though the holidays, you feel it especially. If you're one of the only believers in your family, you go with your family and just realize there's something here that's just different, and it's hard at times. And this text reminds us, though, that followers of Jesus are never alone. You are part of a larger story and belong to a special group of people, a special family, the church. 
Uh, anybody here familiar with Harry Potter? You guys heard of Harry Potter? I'm just kidding. Um, if you're familiar with the Harry Potter story, Harry initially grows up feeling like an unwanted child of an unloving adopted family. He suffers alone. It's kind of played for laughs a little bit, but living in a closet under the stairs. He feels differently, but he doesn't know why. And it's not until later when he finds out that he isn't a muggle, that he's actually a wizard. Spoiler, I'm just kidding. Uh, and he call, he's called to a school at Hogwarts that he realizes that he's actually part of a unique people, the wizarding world. He finds a new kind of family there, and Harry is no longer alone. And over time, Harry discovers the greater story that he is a part of, and it's more than he could have ever expected, right? I don't think it's too much to say that each of us makes a similar discovery when we understand the story that God calls us into. We find out that we too are not alone, and that we are also part of something more than we could ever imagine. It's amazing to be a part of the family of God, the church, and to see God's purpose for us. It's a part, we find ourselves in this greater story, and I want you to remember that story as you enter this year. Fourth point, in God's story, number four, you have a guide to follow. You have a guide to follow. And this is good news. 1 Peter 2, 21 to 24 says this, to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. In this greater story, we haven't just been offered by God. We haven't just been given a new beginning and a promised good ending. We've been given a guide to help us, an example to follow. We aren't left to figure out this Christian story, uh, what, what this, how we're supposed to live by ourselves. In the life of Jesus Christ, we see a model way of being human, a way of living that we are to base our own lives upon. We are to follow in his steps, not being deceitful, fleeing from all sin. We are to live like Jesus did, even suffering without seeking vengeance, entrusting ourselves to the one who judges justly. And moreover, Jesus has given us not just himself as a model, he has given his followers the Holy Spirit, an ever-present guide to lead us in the middle of this greater story. Peter actually calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Christ in chapter 1, verse 11. He reminds us that even when we face difficulty and hostility from others, we are blessed because God's Spirit is still with us. 1 Peter 4, 14 says this, If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. In this story, your guide doesn't leave you. Even in the worst moments you have faced or will face, Jesus is with his followers. His spirit is with us, whatever happens, all the way to the very end. All right, fifth point in God's story, number five, you have an enemy. You have an enemy. First Peter 5, 8 says this. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Like all good stories, there is an enemy or an evil to overcome. And the Christian story is no different. We aren't just out here facing our own sinful desires, the damage of a broken world. No, there is a greater enemy working to deceive you, to tempt you, to tell you a different story, to keep you from your true purpose. Satan is who the Bible depicts as human's great enemy, called here our adversary, someone who opposes us, an enemy that seeks to destroy us and keep us from becoming who God created us to be, to keep us from doing the work that God calls us to do, to keep us from believing the story that God has been telling us. Obviously, it goes without saying that believing in a great spiritual enemy isn't a popular thing to do in our secular world. You've probably also seen an overemphasis on these kind of spiritual warfare things by some Christians. Even some Christians, I remember uh, I worked at a Christian bookstore when I was a teenager, um, and there was like books that had like the devil on the cover, like how Satan made like rock music and African beats and stuff. It's just totally ridiculous stuff, right? There's just like weird stuff that Christians sometimes believe about all this. But somewhere between this kind of overemphasis and ignoring the reality of a spiritual realm with a spiritual enemy, we got to find a balance. We have to recognize there's some truth here. Because for me, it actually makes better sense of the real world that I see and experience 
when I recognize that at times there is evil that is so awful and abusive that it must be influenced by some kind of great spiritual enemy. Do you see that in the world? I'd wager that your, the story that you are living actually makes more sense when you factor in an enemy that is seeking to sabotage your faith, to undermine your flourishing, and to confuse your mission in the world. Thinking of an enemy in your story actually might make more sense of the reality that you experience. Okay, sixth point in God's story, number six, your team wins. Your team wins. 1 Peter 5, 10 through 11 says this, And after you have suffered a little while, while God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. These are the closing words uh, from this letter, 1 Peter. And they summarize the message of the book in many ways. While followers of Jesus will face difficulty and suffering, God will eventually make everything right. He will restore what is broken. He will confirm what is unclear. He will strengthen what is weak. He will establish forever the good that now feels so fragile and fleeting that we see in the world. In the end, God wins and promises here that those who endure to the end will reign with him forever. If you are with God, your team wins. The battle will be painful. There will be losses along the way. But in light of this eternal victory, these losses and these struggles we face will feel short. Paul actually explains this in 1 Corinthians 4, 17. He says this, for this light momentary affliction, and this is someone who's being actually physically persecuted, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. How the followers of Jesus' story ends, how we think about the story we're living in the middle of, makes sense of all the struggles and the difficulties, the trials and the pain that we experience along the way. Knowing the ending to our story makes the middle of our story something we can endure and even thrive in the middle of. Uh, For our family, whenever we face some kind of difficulty, uh, something kind of tragedy, something that is difficult to explain to our, our kids, my wife and I remind them, we remind one another, we are still in the middle of this story. Uh, When our kids, aunts and uncles have faced miscarriages, cousins, nieces, nephews, we were excited to meet that we will now never meet. We reminded, we remind one another, we are in the middle of a story, of a larger story. That the world God made was initially perfect, but here in the middle it is broken by sin. One day everything will be made right by a savior king, but today we are in the middle of a longer story. Uh, when my son Finn, his classmate, died of a rare kind of brain cancer in his brain stem a few years back, we reminded him, Finn, you are in the middle of a longer story. When natural disasters happen, when unspeakable evil occurs, when something happens that doesn't make sense, no matter how hard we try to understand it, we remind one another we are in the middle of a greater story. There's going to be twists and turns. There's going to be difficulties. There's a plot to this. But we are in the middle of a story that we can make sense of, that we can endure in the middle of because we know the ending to the story. That one day we will experience a closing of this world's chapter in which all that is presently difficult, unknown, or painful will be made right, be be, be healed, the things that are hurt and broken. The grief that we're facing or we will face in the coming year will be quenched. In the end of our story, God's team wins, and that is part of why we cling to him in faith here in the middle of it. Okay, so that's a little overview of kind of some of the themes of 1 Peter. And if we, if we understand that those, those ideas and we come back to the text that David read earlier, uh, God's story for the people of God is, is easily understood. And this text that we are looking at can be applied very quickly, very relevantly as we enter this new year. So I'm going to read the, the text that David read, make a few comments of application, and then we'll be done. So I just want to hold in mind everything we had said so far, and let me reread the text that we started with. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 17. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Peter's instructions here are really simple. I'm going to summarize them like this. And I want to encourage you, I want them to encourage you practically in this coming year. There are four quick application points. Number one, the summary of this text, 
We need to keep fearlessly, fearlessly keep doing good. Number two, do not be afraid. Number three, honor Christ in everything. And number four, be prepared to tell God's story. Fearlessly keep doing good. Do not be afraid. Honor Christ in everything. Be prepared to tell God's story. Peter reminds the church that even though they might face difficulty or resistance from a hostile culture, they shouldn't give up on seeking the common good of their neighbors or living with the moral character that Christ calls them to. They are to live by Christ's example, seeing him as a guide, not just in enduring difficulty, but also honoring Christ with their actions among their neighbors. They shouldn't grow weary in doing good, and we should neither this year. Peter is saying that believers' lives should be so honorable So of such high character that when we face injustice or opposition, it should be because of the good we're doing, not injustice or opposition because of any wrong that we have done. Now, this sounds kind of complicated, this this text a little bit, but think of it like this. Someone can be treated unfairly because of a crime they have committed, right? They do something wrong, but because of prejudice against them or, or their kind of people, they face unfair treatment. This is unjust, and yet it happens regularly, right, in justice systems around the world, including our own. And so as religious minorities in a hostile world, Peter's audience would have sort of expected unfair treatment if they have done something wrong when they faced the justice system of the Roman world. If they did something that they shouldn't do, if they broke a law, they would have anticipated a harsher punishment than other people. But Peter is challenging them further. He's saying uh, that they should not just expect unfair treatment for doing something immoral or evil. They should expect unfair treatment for doing something good. It's interesting to think about that. So while it's unfair to be treated inequitably for doing something wrong, Peter says it's, that, that it's better to be treated harshly for doing good. It's even a kind of blessing. Uh, why is that? Why, what, what, how can we make sense of this kind of thing? And, and I want to say that this does happen when we seek the good of the world. It, it doesn't always go well. It isn't always received with, like, thanksgiving from others. Because when we suffer and we're doing good, I think Peter has in mind, when we're loving our neighbor, when we're refusing to worship the idols of our culture, when we, aren't, when we are following the example of Jesus, who was entirely righteous, but he faced the most severe, and in his case, unfair punishment, we're sort of getting to live his kind of life. Peter reminds us to live like Jesus, to, to serve and to bless our world, and when doing so, we're going to experience some of what it means to walk like him. So let us overflow with love and respect. Let us care for the poor and the vulnerable. Let us love our neighbors sacrificially as we might love ourselves. If we face persecution and opposition for this, let us rejoice because we are following in Jesus' steps. As Jesus himself said on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is practically what it looks like to honor Christ in our hearts, as our text says. This text reminds us that we should keep doing good, even when we face opposition, and that we should probably expect some level of difficulty from the world around us. So as you enter this year, as you live on mission, if you're a believer in Jesus in this world, you should expect some pushback. But we should always respond in a way that honors Christ not fearing those who oppose us, but treating them with respect and gentleness. As Peter himself said earlier in this letter, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak evil against you, they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Peter is again reminding us of how the story ends. He's pointing back to this greater story, this great ending, that we might be inspired to endure hardship, but not only to endure, but to point people towards Jesus and the hope that we have in him. I want to end today and wrap up by just uh, looking again for a third time at the middle uh, verse of our text today. This is 1 Peter 1, 13. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Uh, I said at the beginning that Peter's instructions here aren't just simply telling people to endure hardship. It's not just like, keep going. Rather, he points us to this greater story. And I think that is at the heart of what Peter is instructing us to do as well, uh, is, is, to, is also to do and to tell this to a world that opposes us. Followers of Jesus were not just to endure difficulty. We are to give others a compelling reason for the faith and the hope that we have. 
We do that by doing good in the world, but also by telling others the story that we believe. This is that message, right? This is that story. The story that we believe and tell ourselves becomes the story we tell our world. It's something like this, that nothing in their life, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, is accidental. That God offers everyone a new beginning and a protected future. That no one has to live life alone. That God offers everyone a new family. That there is a savior who offers to be their guide when they're in the middle of difficulty and confusion. And that we all together have a common enemy who seeks to divide and destroy. And lastly, that God offer, God wins. And that he ultimately will defeat this enemy, save his followers, and fully redeem and restore this broken world. We offer to others the story that we live. Let's pray. God, it can be heavy to think about our own stories and the stories we tell ourselves and the stories other people have told about us. But I just pray, Lord, in these moments, these quiet moments, Lord, that you would make clear the lies that we may have told ourselves or someone else has told about us and that you would also make clear the greater truth that you say about us, Lord, that we are your beloved children. For those of us who are just exploring faith, Lord, I pray that you would invite, they would hear your invitation to be a part of this greater story, to be a part of this great community and family and mission in the world, to seek God, to seek the good of the world. God, I pray that you would speak a story over us that empowers us to live faithfully for you in this coming year. In Jesus' name.